me, did you? Here! Here! No! It was like any other day. Um, my sister Kathy and I thought that we would spend some sister time together before I headed off to college. So she invited me to go to the beach with her boyfriend. and um, I was supposed to have had a tennis date that afternoon, but he canceled out on me. So I had an afternoon free and I jumped into my sister's Volkswagen and headed down to the beach and left my towel up on the sand and waded out into this water and saw some children jumping off of a raft. An athlete that I was, I just swam right out to it without touching bottom. So I didn't have a clear idea of how deep the water really was or how shallow. All I saw were children jumping off, diving off. And of course, I'm a tall 17 year old. And I did a pike dive off of this raft and did not pull out of it in time. It was a really stupid thing to do. And immediately my head hit the sand, snapping my neck back, crunching my fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae, uh, severing my spinal cord, and I'm just floating face down. Johnny? This program raises questions. This program is for people who find it hard to trust God. The best answers are wrapped in flesh and blood. My friends, people who are enduring real tragedies every single day. Quadriplegia, muscular dystrophy, stroke, bankruptcy, loneliness, singleness. We're gonna to talk to those very people who have touched my life. I had a wonderful childhood, a childhood of much singing, much hiking and camping, and a lot of art. Um, although my daddy was a housing contractor, his hobby was oil painting, and he'd come home from work after dinner, pull out his paints, set them up on his desk, get out his palette, and oh my goodness, as soon as I saw him do that, I would quick run and go get my Roy Rogers coloring book with my crayons, and I'd, I'd sit down on the floor next to my dad, and I'd just watch him paint these awesome, awesome um, renderings of horses and cowboys and Indians and old adobes in Mexico, and. He would flip through National Geographic magazines and he'd find uh, pictures of horses and, oh my goodness. And, and, and when he would start painting, I, I would just look up so longingly and I treasured those moments uh, when he would lift me up on his knee and he'd take his big hand around my stubby little one and we'd grab a brush, dab in the oils, and then together we'd sweep and swirl this color across this magnificent canvas and oh my goodness daddy look what I'm doing look what I'm doing it, it, it wasn't me doing it at all it was it was my dad but you couldn't have convinced me of that when I was a little girl I thought I was painting those pictures I get misty eyed just thinking now of how wonderful my childhood was um, not only horseback riding but camping along the dunes of the Delaware shore during the summer times for, for a couple of three or four weeks on end, going hiking with my daddy, moonlight horseback rides on a full moon. And all this to me as a child was so magical. It was so winsome and wonderful. And, and I, I would come home from these experiences and I just have to, have to express it. And I think my art for me became a way to showcase all this intangible, mysterious, wonderful joy. When I finally encountered Christ in a personal way uh, in 1964, I was only 14 years old, and um, my art uh, began to have meaning to me. All these experiences that I had gone through as a child, these mesmerizing, wonderful, winsome expressions of, of mountains and rivers and seascapes and sand dunes and now had meaning. God was behind it all. God was this master artist. Somewhere when I was 15, 16 years old, however, my um, artwork became a little utilitarian. Uh, I'd, I'd draw your senior picture for $5. 
you know, I, I, I wasn't into my art uh, for the purpose of um, expressing what was happening way down deep inside. Uh, I was into art because I could make a quick five bucks as a senior in high school if you'd let me draw your senior picture. And um, never took art classes, I could have. Uh, back then in the 60s, they offered art classes in high school, but I wasn't interested. I thought I had that down. Uh, been there, done that. I know what it's all about. Phew. What a crazy 16, 17 year old I was. No wonder I broke my neck. Hmm. Am I going to be in this thing a long time? Dad? Please be straight with me. It'll really help to know. Johnny, the doctor says your injury is more or less permanent. Honey, your dancing days are over. Johnny, you're paralyzed. You're never going to be able to use your hands. You're never going to be able to walk. And I remember a prayer that I had offered up to God shortly before my high school graduation in which I knew I wasn't living life as a Christian, as a real Christian. I was being a hypocrite with my boyfriend. I, I was really messing things up. And I remember praying right before my high school graduation, God, do something in my life to turn it around, jerk it right side up because I'm making a mess of my life. And I have no power, God, to follow you as I should. So would you please do something? And it was maybe, I guess, two weeks after high school graduation when um, my sister invited me to go to the beach. And I took that dive. But lying there in the hospital bed, I remembered that prayer. And I was stunned that God should take me so seriously. How could you do this? I mean, I'm only 17 years old. Not only that, I'm a, I'm a young Christian. And okay, so I, I didn't follow you like I should, but this can't possibly be an, an answer to a prayer to be drawn closer to you. And if it is, I, I just don't know that I want to trust you with any more of my prayers. How could you let this happen to me? You know, a root of bitterness began to sink down deep into my heart. And I became a little crusty, a little calloused about the God of the Bible. It's stupid trying to talk to you. You're as impersonal as the machines in this place. What a dumb thing to believe you really care about people. For about 12 months, I was in bed. And around the end of that 12 month time, I had moved to a numb, emotionless despair. God, if I can't die. Show me how to live. Please. That time of despair didn't last long. And when it finally lifted, it was just, it was, it was so wonderful to finally feel something. Okay, so maybe it was depression, but it was feeling something, not checking out of life emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. Not so tight. You'll get riders cramping your jaw. Back to first green. Writing the alphabet, holding a pen between my teeth, was just a poignant metaphor for how elementary everything was going to have to be now. I was going to have to start over. I was going to have to learn everything, just like being in first, second, third grade. It was a, maybe a week or so later that another visit to occupational therapy, my therapist came up to me and said, I want you to try and draw something. I heard you were an artist. 
You gonna throw that at me? I want you to draw something on it. <laughs> you gotta be kidding. Draw something you like. Use these. It won't work. I used to do a lot of sketching in charcoal, because my father's sort of an artist. But that was when I had my hands. The skill, the talent comes from up here. With a little practice, you can do as well with your mouth as your hands. I mean, sure, I did that when I was on my feet, but I'm paralyzed. I can't draw. And she encouraged me. She said, no, here, try. And um, with that pointed wooden stick in between my teeth, I began etching into this wet clay. But as I'm drawing, I'm doing my favorite subject. This is a horse, and there's a rider, and a saddle, and a cowboy hat. And, and I looked at it, and, and oh my goodness, I can draw. Oh, what a shock. I can, I can still draw. When I began to see that I could uh, wield some power with this pen between my teeth, all those uh, habits of self-expression and art began to well up, and I began to see that a sketch pad could be a way to express this despair that I was going through. And uh, so it was maybe a, a week or two after I tried that alphabet that my occupational therapist encouraged me to draw something, anything. And so I did, and I think she was very excited to see what I might do. This was, good, this was a work in progress. And, um, but as I continued to draw, and as this ghoulish face took shape, um, she was somewhat quieted, she was revolted. She, she realized that I was, uh, I was dying on the inside. And I was so afraid of living on the outside. And this uh, self-portrait that I did full of despair, full of angst, full of helplessness and hopelessness. This particular rendering, however, later on, uh, when I began to get my act together emotionally, spiritually, mentally, when I began to move forward, I wanted nothing to do, of course, with the past and all that horrible despair, those feelings of anxiety and anguish, so I tore up the original, dumped it in the trash. Now I'm sorry. But when they recreated my life for the movie Johnny, they wanted to recreate that same sketch. And so um, the art director on that film, uh, under my directions, re recreated it. And to me, even though I did not sketch this particular rendering, it's much like the original, and I keep it as a reminder of how far I've come, uh, from whence I've come, and I never want to forget how God pulled me up out of that miry pit and set me not apart with the dead, but with the living. I don't know why I thought I, I had lost my talent with that diving accident, but I, I had just assumed that the talent resided in your wrist or your hand. And suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, the talent isn't in my hand, it's in my head, it's in my heart. Oh my goodness, I can do something. Okay, Lord. Stop trying to work it out to make sense just for me. Whatever surprises you have in store, or no surprises at all, I guess it's up to you. Trust kicked in. 
And I began to take those faltering few steps of faith. And I tell you what, you give God an inch, he'll take a mile. And I got pushed into this future of uh, hope and purpose. And joy doesn't depend on whether or not I can run 25 laps around a hockey field. No, joy and meaning and purpose was, was, was satisfaction. I was becoming satisfied with, with who God is. And, and who God to me was, is this God who whispered to me in those darkest moments, Johnny, if I loved you enough to send my son to die for you, I'm not gonna trash you, I'm not gonna throw you. I you mean everything to me. And I may have forsaken my own son on his cross, but I'll never forsake you. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, invisible things, unseen things, realities that are way beyond what feels like the pain of the present. When an artist chooses a frame for a painting, he does so with the purpose of highlighting the best qualities of the work of art. He finds a frame suitable to highlight the characteristics of the artist having expressed himself. My wheelchair is a frame perfectly suitable for this work of redemption that Christ has made in my life. And it's highlighting the best qualities of God, the master artist. I would have never painted this picture of my life this way. I would have trashed it. I would have thought it had no value. But, but God saw something and he worked his genius in my life. And now my wheelchair is a frame around, I think, a portrait, I hope, of Jesus. Love, patience, Endurance, self-control, tender, loving kindness, gentleness, meekness, all these qualities of Jesus, I hope, are reflecting through my life, and I hope, I hope the wheelchair frames that. And just, just like any good work of art, I mean, a, a frame is not supposed to draw attention to itself, but it's supposed to focus the viewer's attention on the painting. And I hope this wheelchair does not draw attention to itself. I hope all it does is augment and make more beautiful, more glorious, the image of Jesus that he has painted, having redeemed all those ugly things in my life to make something quite beautiful. God is not uh, embarrassed by our doubts and fears and anxieties. He's not even embarrassed about our despair. He's the one who delights in taking what we think is impossible and making all sorts of possibilities out of it. You know, just like bridging a stuck of hands. <laughs> okay, put it down. Good, very good. My life was once in ashes, ruined, but God has given me a Praise, the oil of joy, beauty, and not just in my life, but I think in my artwork. People often ask me how long it takes to do one of my originals. Well, I'll be quite honest, it'll take up to 10, 11, 12 months, but I would say maybe eight or nine of those months are spent experimenting with colors, trying to decide on the composition, solving all my problems before I embark into the final design. There are some strokes I'll never be able to do. I mean, even when I did the three wise men uh, on their camels crossing a bridge against a moonlit night, 
and there's that wild, windy, starry sky uh, influenced by Van Gogh. And the way I did that is uh, I put the easel, uh, or the, the, the painting up on my easel, and I dabbed into the, the oil paint and choo -choo 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 -choo. Okay, a little bit more movement. Okay, rotate the canvas more. Do, 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 do. I must, I, if somebody had looked at me painting that picture, they must have thought I looked like a chicken pecking for grain. The mouth was never designed to represent what the hand can do. So I'm limited, my strokes are limited. I have to credit one man with helping me understand the world of art. Uh, my friend Jim Sewell, I met him during the making of the movie Johnny, and he offered to give me private instruction. Oh my, a whole new vista of artistic possibilities opened up to me. I remember he said to me, you know, Johnny, if somebody wants to be a concert pianist, they spend a lot of time listening to other concert pianists. Um, if you want to be a good artist, sit with me, spend time with me. Let's look at Degas, let's look at Monet, let's examine Cezanne and Rembrandt, John Singer Sargent. Let's spend time with the masters. And I will show you, I will prove to you that you will master a whole new level of color, composition, style, and meaning. He was the one who rendered this particular lion sketch of me with pencils. And when I saw it, he captured so much um, what my life has been all about. Because there was a time during that diving accident and while I was in the hospital, that I felt as though every puzzle piece was never gonna fit. They'd all gone missing. But when I got close to God, and when I began to read the Bible, the puzzle pieces slowly began to fit together. I learned through time that wisdom is not being able to put the puzzle all together because some of those pieces of that puzzle you'll never find. They'll go missing until the other side of eternity. No, wisdom is not seeing everything from God's point of view. Wisdom is trusting Him even when the puzzle pieces don't fit. When you become privy to a really good thing, you just can't wait to share it. You just can't wait to get it out. You just want to tell everybody. And whether I do it through writing or speaking or singing, I'm gonna do it through painting. And so occasionally, yes, my art is on exhibit, like it was recently down on Laguna Beach. And, and it was my joy to just guide these people from one painting to the next, telling one story after another, why I did this, what it's all about, what I learned, what you can learn. I just can't believe I get to do that. Thousands of artists over hundreds of years have painted this a million different ways. Who am I to come up with something new and different? But I wanted this particular rendering to portray Mary as being anchored to Earth. You know, she's not part of a baby Jesus world yet. She's just not, just barely clued into it. And I wanted her to be firmly anchored to Earth. So I thought the best way to convey that artistically would be to make her hips and legs and knees, the fabric eventually become the twisting, winding hills, which lead to Calvary, those three crosses uh, in the back there. And how the story of the first advent uh, is, is closely uh, linked always to the cross. We can't talk about um, Jesus' birth without talking about his death and resurrection. I think I'm producing many more beautiful things using a brush between my teeth than I ever did, using a pencil between my fingers. If you were to ask me what, what I want my mansion and glory to be, I'll take a big wheat field by the mountains with just a little ranch house and a couple of sycamore trees. I mean, that, that's, where, that's my mansion in heaven right there. One day when I get to heaven with my new glorified body, I'm going to pick up a couple of paintbrushes and with both hands sweep and swirl and 
paint the biggest murals you've ever seen. I didn't know what to expect. You know, I mean, when I used to see your pictures, you know, I mean, I, I, the first ones I was like, wow, she's really good. <laughs> you're, you're really good, yeah. I love to paint myself a little bit, but I've been taken over by business and things, but yeah, this is great. Wow. Well, every artist enjoys hearing that from someone else to think that, you know, my artwork might inspire or encourage others. You know, and that's always why I like to, you know, when my artists reproduce, they put a pencil in my mouth and they show the photo of that. and I. You know, some people think that's aggrandizing, aggrandizing, but I don't think so. I, I just want people to understand what I'm able to overcome by God's grace, and that if He can empower me to rise above my circumstances, what can He do in the lives of others? Isaiah 61 says that He gives beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. I have no idea what legacy my artwork will have. Remember, it's God's artwork, not mine. So I doubt that it will sit in public storage. I think God, because He's the God of discovery and adventure and surprises, He grabs hold of every avenue through which to showcase His gospel. And I pray that He might continue to use what is His and I know he will, to honor his son, to glorify his gospel, and maybe to point back to this lady in a wheelchair who did this with her mouth, okay. But I want people to see the light in front of the darkness. I want them to see the good composition underneath the style. I want them to see Johnny written by my mouth. And remember that there was once a young woman who thought her life was in ashes, but God made something beautiful out of it.